So, I'm sure that you're all aware that this month, the month of May, is the month where God is roaring. He's been roaring for you. Amen? And as we entered that message of roaring, I felt led today to roar a little bit. Because it's very easy for us, if we're not careful, to take on like a frustration or a victim mindset, and that's not of God. And so what happens is that you're going to either be defeated or you're going to live victorious. Say de defeated, say defeated, defeated. Or, victorious. or victorious. There's no in between. See, one of the biggest challenges that I see today on the face of the earth is that everybody wants to live in the middle. Everybody wants to straddle the line. We want to live in the gray, but we wonder why God doesn't work the miracle signs and wonders that he promised. I'm telling you, it's not God's fault. It's our inability to sell out to the, re to the revelation that we're victorious. You're a winner. Say, I'm a winner. Say, I'm a winner. I'm not a whiner. I'm a winner. Every time that you get an email, you get a bill, you get a phone call, you have somebody that walks past you and says something or doesn't say something, remind yourself that God already calls you a winner. Amen? Amen? So as this message of the roar of God in May continues to minister to me, now God wants me to minister through me this word called the upper room. If you read the word for this month, the prophetic word, it speaks of the upper room. And that really made me process more about us understanding the upper room. It's easy to understand what a roar is, right? What's a roar sound like? I, I don't know. I'm kind of scared to roar through this mic. It's like, roar, right? It's like strong, like, roar. You got to roar sometimes. You just got to let, it makes you feel better. It's healthy. It's even therapeutic. Thank God. But we have to roar. And so as I was looking to the word for this month, the Lord said, before you introduce my roar, invite them into my upper room. See, we can always be at war and 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 at war. But if you don't know the peace of God, if you don't have encounters with God, what good is a roar? And if you don't believe God is real, but people are speaking that over you or speaking it for you, it doesn't change you until you go into the upper room. Amen. So I really believe that it is very important as Christians that we see the value of God's upper room. And so I want to share this titled message from your mother's womb to the upper room. Discovering God's purpose for your life. So all the lies, you just put away your nails, let your roars rest a tiny bit, put away the claws. And we are going to focus on this message from your mother's womb. Well, because, you know, the claw doesn't stay out all the time. They, it goes, they can control them claws. So I'm just saying, like, right now we're not, we're not, about, we're not battling right now, guys. Just, we're into, we're, this today is about receiving. All right, so you can let down your guard a little bit. You know, we, I know that we have prayed plenty, intercessors, you know that? And they, this atmosphere has been prepared. That's why there's always resistance, but there's always breakthrough because there's been prayer that's prepared the atmosphere for our hearts and for this place for the kingdom of God to be built. It will not be stopped. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> so from your mother's womb to the upper room, discovering God's purpose for your life, the power of living a life from God's upper room. I want to tell you something. Before you can start roaring, we have to first start living our lives from the place of power, from the place of God's upper room. we got to be in the upper room, people. When you're in the basement, when you're in the alleyways and, and the highways and every other way, we miss out on the power that is unlocked when you live from God's upper room. You know, I want to talk about the upper room. And I'm going to give you some qualities or some values or characteristics of a life that is connected to living in the upper room. So for our, the note takers, take notes. I don't think it's going to be up there. So just buckle up. The first thing about the upper room is that it is the place of God's presence and God's will for your life. 
It's not just presence. It's his will for your life. Guys, that's different, those two things. I want, I'm going to explain this a little bit. It is a place of God's presence, God's will for your life. Why did the Lord have me say that or share that? Because a lot of us go to church to experience something that we don't experience at home. To experience something that we can't reproduce in our cars. To experience something that it's almost like we need to be around other people for it to be created. For it to exist. But when you live from God's upper room, you now are living a life according to the will of God for you. Amen. Oh, thank you. I right, got one. That's good. <laughs> Guys, God's will for you is the only will that's going to be real. It's the only will that's going to keep you in the upper room. Your will and his will, if they don't come in alignment, it, it's not a thrill. <laughs> it might get real crazy really fast. And so I want us to understand that it's not enough to go, to go from experience, to go to church to experience God. No, it's not just about being the presence of God. It is now aligning your life with his will for your life. Amen. That's different. Amen. See, one of the biggest challenges about Kingdom Rise Church in your life and my life is that we don't stay the same. Hear what I'm saying? I want you to come, but I want you to change according to God's will for your life. Not what I want. Not my will, but your will be done. And see, that's the thing about the upper room, and it's crazy how the upper room is so mysterious in Scripture. It's so mysterious in the body of Christ because we don't really talk about it. But there's four stories that I'm going to be sharing with today that all encounter in God moves powerfully from the upper room. The upper room is God's intimate meeting place of encounter. It's a place of refuge. It's a place of power. It's a place of God's miraculous. That's a lot. The upper room is a different realm. Hear what I'm saying? The upper room, and at some point it's not going to keep coming, <laughs> keeping up with me. The upper room is a different realm. What does that mean? It's like anybody who's ever gone hiking, or you watch uh, Discovery Channel, <laughs> or maybe you just watch it on YouTube. All of these people that go and they, they climb Mount Whitney, Mount Rainier, Mount Everest, the Himalayas. The, uh, if, you go to, to, if you go to the Andes Mountains, what you'll realize the first thing is that the oxygen is different the higher that you go. Can I tell you that when you live a life from the perspective of God, that's higher than down here, all of a sudden the oxygen gets thin. That's why your life gets really intense. Because you found yourself climbing the spiritual staircase of staying and getting in God's upper room for your life. It's amazing that when people go hiking, there's these gentlemen, they're called Sherpas. And these Sherpas, if they carry tanks of oxygen, these Sherpas actually live in those geographic areas where these mountain ranges exist throughout the world. The Sherpas are very careful about helping guide people and when to, know, when to tell someone, yo, you need to take a break. You need to take a time out or get some oxygen or guess what? You need to turn around. You know that when people go hiking in these places, they lose limbs and sometimes they even lose their lives. To me, it's crazy, but hey, for whoever wants to climb those mountains and deal with frostbite, God bless you. But when it comes to the spirit, we're all called to climb. When it comes to the spirit, hear what I'm saying? We're all called to climb. Nobody is a camper. They had this whole thing one time. They talked about campers and and, 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 and climbers and, and there was a third one and it doesn't really matter at this point but the bottom line is this is that God has you climbing you are climbing you are not camping out you are not stopping you are going all the way to the top say top, top. say upper room. Upper room. Upper room. upper room upper room upper room let's stand up man we got to get the circulation up in the spiritual situation hallelujah we need to let our spirits wake up our, our bodies our minds and our souls we got to get an alignment Lord, I, right now in the name of Jesus, I ask for a spiritual chiropractor to come into this place right now and activate an alignment. Lord, the Bible says that you have ears to hear, hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. Lord, I deliver people from being listeners and, get, and I transcend them. I pull them out of the natural and step them into the spiritual realm of hearing and not just listening. 
Today, God, we refuse to leave the same. Because we are your church and we do have ears to hear. Hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to his church. Amen. You may be seated. So the upper room has a, is a different realm. It's a different atmosphere. It's a different reality. Woo! That's the most exciting part. I don't know how I say it. Okay, anyway. It's a different reality. What does that mean? It means that, as, as, and I know that it's very popular now, but there's this thing that's called like the multiverse or the metaverse. All these worlds, dimensions. Can I tell you something? When you are living from the upper room, the reality you see is not the reality of God. Amen. The reality you see is not limiting or able to limit or constrain your God. The upper room is a different place. It's a different reality. One day you have no money, the next day you have money. One day you don't feel so good, the next day you feel like a million bucks and you can walk on water. Why? Because all of a sudden your life has transcended dimensions and you stepped out of the natural and you stepped into the upper room. The upper room has its own atmosphere. That means that there's people in your life that are not going to want to stick around because it's hard to breathe in the atmosphere that you're called to. And that's hard. It's hard when you love people that are biologically related to you. Friends that have walked a lifetime with you. But the oxygen requirements on you have acclimated spiritually to the call of God. And theirs hasn't. That's a place where the upper room is changing you. Because it is a different atmosphere. Praise be to God. You know, as we were talking about the prophetic word, this one last little part of it, and then we're going to continue in this upper room journey. I want you to know that the upper room has its own sound. There is a sound to the presence of God. There is a sound that comes from people that worship God in spirit and in truth. True worshipers. True worshipers are people that live life from what? God's upper room. A true worshiper fights to stay in his upper room. Fights to stay in alignment with the will of God. Fights and won't yield, meaning won't quit, till they get everything God has for them based off of their time in the upper room. Amen? Amen. And lastly, which is so beautiful, the upper room is a place where God can bring dead things back to life. You ever have something die in your life? You ever have certain dreams seem like they evaporated? Certain people that you loved not here today? Certain material things or dreams, homes, cars, jobs? It ain't here today. But I want you to know something. When you live life from God's upper room, nothing is too far from God to revive or to resurrect. Because that's where God brings dead things back to life. Who's ready for some more life? Can I get some people that want to live? It's amazing because when you really start to process your life, Jesus lost it so that we could gain it. That's why you love him so much. Because he loved you so much, he said, I'll go to the grave for you. But because I'm God, I can't stay there because it's not meant for me. I want you to know that when you realize a life through the lens of the upper room, God will bring life and bring you a new life, abundant life through the upper room. Amen? So I want to introduce us to the upper room in the Bible. And I want to take us to the story of Elijah. Not Elisha. We're going with the original, Elijah. And we find the upper room being mentioned in Scripture. And so I believe we're going to start in 1 Kings 17. Follow along and then I will explain. It says, after this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill. 
His illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. Sounds like high atmosphere. And she said to Elijah, what have you against me, O God, or man of God? You have come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. And he said to her, give me your son. I too believe that he was like that. I believe that she demanded, but he also made it very clear that he had not lost authority and he didn't know who he was in Christ. Amen? Give me your son. And he took him from her arms and he carried and carried him up into the upper chamber where he lodged, laid him on his own bed, and he cried to the Lord, the prophet Christ, Oh Lord my God, have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I sojourn by killing her son? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times, and he cried to the Lord, Oh Lord my God, let this child's life come into him again. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elisha. And the life of the child came into him again. And he revived. And Elisha took the child, brought him down from the upper chamber or the upper room into the house. And he delivered him to his mother. And Elijah said, see, your son lives. And the woman said to Elijah, very funny, now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. So I want to talk about the situation because the first time that we see an upper chamber, an upper room uh, mentioned scripturally speaking, or it's one of the earliest. And I want you to know that before Jesus came, the upper room was already God's place to do surgery. It was already God's atmosphere. It was already another dimension within our dimension where God does beautiful things to broken things. And this woman, let's go back to the very last scripture. I think it was at 22 or 24. 24. It says, and the woman said, and I, and I love this, and we're going to get the whole story, don't worry. But it says, and the woman said to Elijah, now I know that you are a man of God. And that the word of the Lord in your mouth is true. Uh, this, most of you guys probably don't think that's very funny. <laughs> and it probably sounds very rude. But the truth is, is that God had already used Elijah to provide for her through an entire famine. And all of a sudden now she wants to confirm or, or verify that he in fact is a man of God. He already proved he was a man of God to her. It's amazing how we have experiences in life where God has to take us back into upper rooms to remind us who he is to us. You know, the story with Elijah is so beautiful because this woman, the woman, what's, what's, she's the name, she is the woman from Zarephath, the widow from Zarephath. The widow has one son. She loves him very much, very much. She finds herself one day, there's a massive famine. Every grocery store is empty. Put yourself in that situation for a second. Not some grocery stores. Every grocery store is empty. She is scrounging, scripture says, for morsels to make a little cake, drink a little water, and say goodbye to this life with their son. No sooner does that happen, oh my God, I'm speaking to somebody who's in desperate situations. When her situation is at its worst, God shows up. Hi, my name is the prophet Elijah, and I need to take residence in your home. And by the way, before you decide to eat that tender morsel, which will be your last, or seemingly so, I want you to give me that double cheeseburger and I'll give you a piece of whatever's left over once I eat. The woman says to Elijah, Elijah, this is all we have. After this, there is no more. Don't you realize there's a famine in the land? After this, we're goners. See, when you live a life outside the upper room of God, you are a goner. 
You will be a Christian that says that God is powerful, but you won't experience his power. Because you won't live from his upper room. That's why the upper room is so important, and nobody wants to talk about the upper room. And that's why it has me so, uh, has me got a little bit of roar going on inside of me today. Because we have to see this. So what happens is that all of a sudden, what happens is that she gets, she feeds him first. Contrary to what she wants to do. Can I tell you that sometimes God's going to ask you to give or release what you don't want to give or release. God's going to ask you to do what you don't feel like doing. And you can even have excuses for why you don't need to do it. Like we all do. But the difference was that this widow had no other option because death was inevitable. You know, people ask oftentimes, Pastor Ray, why is it that God is so powerful in the third world countries? Because people don't have an option. When your child has a distended stomach and worms in it, and it's half the body weight of a child of their age, and all they do is scream because they cannot stop hurting, and they can't stop being hungry. All you have is God, because you don't get a dime in the bank for a doctor. The doctor's too far from your town, too far from your village. You tell me real quickly how you change your attitude towards God and what he can do for you. That's life from the upper room. See, in America, what happens, and it's a, it is a privilege. You are a privileged people. I want you to know that. Say, I'm a privileged person. Say, we're a privileged people. I want you to say it three times. We're a privileged people. Uh, which is beautiful. That's next weekend. Uh, my dad's dad, so my grandfather, and all of his brothers were sent to World War II together. They were one of the families that helped change the laws about sending all of the kids to war at the same time because they may not all come back. When the war happened in World War II, many families had no children afterwards. I want you to know something. It's just, it's different. It's different when you see how God has plans for your life. And Memorial Day is a powerful time. And because of Memorial Day, and because of the blood of Jesus, come on, let's not forget Jesus, we are a blessed people living in the most blessed nation on the face of the earth. Thank you, Jesus. Happy Memorial Day. Preview. It is important that we really, I know that it's crazy. I know that things are jacked up, but God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. So I just want to bring context to that. So we have this situation, there's no food in the grocery stores, and, and we go back to what I said about the third world countries, and so there's a desperation that there is no other option. There is no Kaiser Permanente down the street, there is no Tylenol down at the, at the corner shop, there is nothing. It's either God shows up or you're a goner. So all of a sudden now we bring ourselves up to speed biblically to the widow of Zarephath. And her son and her are going to eat their last and they're going to check out. But what does God do? And this is so beautiful because it speaks to so many other things about faith in the Lord. The man of God, God through the man of God, hear what I'm saying. God through the man of God has a widow and her only child give their first and last meal or the best portion of their last meal to him. Most people, hear what I'm saying because this happens in church all the time. Most people will be like, that's jacked up. Why would God ask a widow with a child that's sure to die to give a portion of her last to God through the man of God? Because if she takes care of God or his kingdom, God's kingdom is sure to take care of you. Amen. Hear what I'm saying? It is crazy when you got no money in the bank and God says you got to Sow a seed. You're like, all right, God, I don't even know what the heck's going on. I'm going to do it. All right. Because you know it's God. It's not me. Hear what I'm saying? You know it's God because God says, I still want you to put me first even if you don't got a whole lot. I still need you to win in the battle of your finances. This is just one area. I need you to win in the battle of finances. But if you will never put me first in your finances, your finances will never be first. Amen. If you want abundance, then you need to come to the source and not get married to the resource. Don't attach yourself to the money. Attach yourself to the money giver, the money releaser, the money equipper. That's God. I want you to know something beautiful about Kingdom Rise Church. Single mothers, on average, are the most aggressive tithers and givers. Statistically, in America, that makes no sense. 
But when you have God and he is your groom, Jesus, and you are his bride, you don't have, you don't choose to do anything less than put him first. Amen. Amen. I, I say that because a lot of people don't understand. They're like, it, like I said, everybody has a different process. We all have a different journey. I get that. I'm not like telling, I'm not trying to poop on, no, on nobody or offend anybody. So I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm saying. Please don't misunderstand. One of the things God showed me today is that we are not fighting against each other. We're fighting for each other. Anytime in your spirit that you feel like you're fighting with each other, please pray. And please take authority over that spirit and say, I rebuke you, I bind you, I render you void, and I send you out of this house of prayer, this house of deliverance, this house of unity, and I speak unity in its place because this is the house of God. Get out, Satan, in Jesus' name. We have to check the spirit. So I, I share that because oftentimes when you don't have is absolutely when you need to make sure you start building protection around your finances. Where else do you build protection? By knowing God. Praying, people. You know that nobody can, I mean, people can intercede for you, right? But when you get, when you, for those who get into heaven, you need to talk to God yourself. Oh. Nobody can do the talking for you. Those who get in, know the voice of God and obey it. Jesus. Hear what I'm saying? Yes. And those are the people that live in the upper room. Jesus. Hear what I'm saying? Because a lot of people don't realize that. They go to church, and because Jesus loves you, they're like, cool, man, I'm just going to stay the same, man. I'm going to go ahead and do my dirt, and I'll come back, and Jesus will wipe me clean as snow or whatever on Sunday, and then I'll go back to my hot mess, and Jesus knows, and Jesus loves me, and the grace is all that good stuff. That's great and fine and dandy, but I'm telling you right now, it is going to be an incredible tragedy when the rapture happens and many people are left behind because they didn't live life from the upper room. It's going to be crazy when people go to heaven. And I, I saw this beautiful video of this older gentleman before he passed. He's already passed. He shared a testimony. And he says that he had an out-of-body experience. And in the out-of-body experience, he spent, I want to say, 15 or 20 minutes. I cannot remember exactly. But in that time, he says that over 2,000 people showed up at the pearly gates and only 50 people got in for the entire face of the world. 2,000 made it to the gates. 50 got in. 1,950 people across the entire face of the earth that thought they, were gonna, they had been following Jesus and serving the Lord, did not know him. I know this message is taking a very interesting turn, but your soul is very important to God. His power in your life is everything. It's not something. God's ready for you to stay, come into, but stay in his upper room. It's time for the atmosphere of your life to change. It's time for you not to be scared when you can't breathe because God is elevating your life. It's hard when you can't breathe, when you can't cry, when you can't scream, when you can't grab anybody because the truth is, is that God is there. There is somebody. His name is the Holy Spirit and he wants to take you into the upper room. Amen. Amen. So all of a sudden we see this mother, we already realize that there's no food, it's all crazy. All of a sudden, what happens is that he, she, the, the man of God, Elijah, gets fed. Uh, now they, they eat the leftovers, <laughs> right? Which are going to be their original meal. And they're eating leftovers after Elijah. And all of a sudden God does a miracle. Elijah says, you know what, the oil that was in that jar... That empty jar, I want you to go ahead and we're going to start, just, just get all your neighbor's jars and, and God's going to do something. And she's like, okay, that's weird. Can I tell you that God will ask you to do weird things sometimes? Yes. It's, not, it's not always going to be specific to the Bible. You will have the Holy Spirit to confirm things, all right? God confirms things, so it's not like way out there. But God will do radical things to prove to you that you matter to him. But the way that you prove to God that he matters to you is that God will require you to also do radical things. Amen. See, your salvation is so radical 
that God is raising up a radical end time army. Hear what I'm saying? You're not just a cute Christian that says, Kumbaya, my Lord. Kumbaya. You are a radical Christian that if somebody in your family is in the hospital, you're the first person to show up. And tell the devil that he can take his hands off of this child. Or that if, if, if it is already a shifting of seasons, that the love of God will bring unity to the loss of that life and bring strength and restoration to every relationship connected to that person in celebration of their life. We have to have a different attitude that requires us to enter into a new altitude and requires a different aptitude. Amen? God's ready to go ahead and take us up into what? The upper... So all of a sudden, this woman gets all these jars together. The jars just start filling up with oil. As a matter of fact, the jars don't stop being full. She survives the entire famine because she's got money. No, she's got the anointing that is giving her oil that won't spoil. Thank you, God, because the oil of God don't spoil. <laughs> Hear what I'm saying? But only people that live from the upper room understand that and experience that for themselves. So all of that being said, now Elijah has now become the, uh, the lengthened stay guest. This has become like an Airbnb, prolonged. He's actually got a little office and a little, little placard out there by his door in the upper room, or upper chamber. And he's taking people and praying for them, all that good stuff, right? So all of a sudden, things get crazy. This woman finds herself with a son that has gotten ill, and he ain't waking up. And so what happens? We've already read it. I'm not reading it to you again. And you're like, thank you, Pastor Ray. We've read it. But how does this end? Verse 24. I'm glad you asked. And the woman said to Elijah, now I know that you're a man of God. He's like, really? Really? And that the word of the Lord in your mouth is true. Can I tell you that for those who live in the upper room of God, the atmosphere of God, the realm of God, the realm of the upper room, the Lord, whatever comes out, the word of the Lord through your mouth and my mouth is true. Because it's not your subjective truth. It's God's absolute truth. It's not society's truth. It's not your belly's truth. It's not your brain's truth. It's not YouTube's truth. It's God's truth. Elijah was moving in the power of God. Prophets have a really challenging life. And oftentimes lonely. Because they have to say things that nobody else wants to say. And they have to go in atmospheres and environments that nobody in their right mind wants to go into. And the reality is, is that prophets oftentimes become the bullseye for people's frustration with God. Even though you just happen to be the face, the messenger. But what happens is the messenger gets beat up because of the message. But the beauty of God is that he still builds up and rewards the righteous and the prophet. The Bible says that, the, that a prophet gets a prophet's reward. So that's the beauty of it. That's the silver lining. So even though anybody who moves prophetically, operates prophetically, you'll understand what I'm saying. But God is faithful. Right, Pastor Sonia? Amen. So I want to talk about the second situation or the second moment or incident that we find an upper room situation. And it takes us to Mark chapter 14. And it all starts with Jesus. It says that Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where is my guest room? where I may eat the Passover with my disciples. And he will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready, there prepared for us. And the disciples set out, and they went to the city, and they found it. The upper room is not imaginary. It's not hidden from you people. They found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. I want you to know that the upper room has been prepared for you. It's available for you. Elijah experienced it. And Jesus prepared it for his disciples and we are his modern day disciples. He's prepared the upper room for you. You just have to enter in. 
And once you enter in, you got to stay in there. And you got to fight. Amen? What happens in the upper room is that we have Jesus and the disciples, they have their last meal together. It is a time of, a place of intimacy. It's a time of encounter with Jesus. Jesus being who? God. I'm trying to like tie in what we talked about at the beginning. So it's a place of encounter. The upper room is a place that God's prepared for you. So I want you to know the upper room is available to you. Those who don't go in the upper room is just because they choose not to go. But I encourage you, I implore you, get in the upper room. Let's go all the way to John chapter 20, verse 19. We're going to see the upper room for a third time. This is after Jesus has died, buried, and resurrected. Follow along with me. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked were where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. Say, peace be with you. Peace be with you. Praise be to God. And to you too. Hallelujah. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. So Jesus is saying, look, it is me. That's like his ID, right? It's like, show me your driver's license, ma'am or sir. He's like, yo, my driver's license is these hands and these feet. Okay? Then the disciples were glad. They're like, that's the real deal. When they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them, again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Don't worry. It's going to get interesting. <laughs> and when he had said this, he breathed on them <laughs> and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Boom. Like an like a atomic bomb as the Spirit gets dropped in that room. Woo! That belly was shaking and quaking. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Wow. And that's it, right? Thumbs up if it's thumbs up. Praise the Lord. So what is, it, what is it about this upper room? I asked myself and I asked God. And God said the upper room is what I had prepared for my disciples and it's what I've prepared for you. The upper room is a place of safety. And it's a place of sanctuary. When Jesus was died, crucified, buried, at this time they, did, he had, they did, were not fully aware that he had resurrected yet. They were quaking in their boots because they went to the last place that they spent with Jesus, which was the upper room. They're like, God, if you're not here, we're going to the last place that we were together. And so they found themselves in the upper room. I encourage you to understand the power of going to God's upper room. The upper room was the only place that made sense when the world was falling apart for the disciples. Imagine that. And I want you to know that that same place is available to you today. The upper room. They ran to the one place that they felt safe. The place that God found for them. And it's the place that God has built for you. It's called the church. So powerful. I want to take us to one last scripture. And it's, and it's going to be with the, uh, it's the Apostle Peter. And then we find ourselves in the book of Acts, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9. <clears throat> now there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. She was full of good works and acts of charity. She was a really legit person. She was a servant leader. Amen? That's, that's beautiful. And in those days she became ill. And died. And when she had washed, and when they had washed her, that means they had prepared her body for burial, they laid her in an upper room. Oh my Lord, here we go. Get ready. Buckle up, people. Since Lida was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him, urging him, Please come with us. Oh, okay, let me say it again. Please come to us without delay. So there's some urgency. They're like, Yo, Jesus, let's go. No, but I got to take care. No, we'll fold your clothes. We'll pack it up. We got to go. We got to go. The train is leaving. So Peter rose and went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the what? Man, you're going to, you're going to, the upper room is going to be something we'll be talking about for, 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 for decades, for generations. Thank you, Jesus. So Peter rose and went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the? 
Man, you guys are getting the hang of it. All the windows stood beside him weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas had made while she was with them. Do not change that. No, go back. <clears throat> so as tradition has it, and I don't know, I'm sure I've taught on it before, but there's this tradition that when someone dies, there's people that professionally get paid to squeal and scream and be all dramatic and all that stuff to make it like, oh, like this is a serious loss, yo. This is a serious loss, but yo, I'm getting paid. So they got people getting professional paid weepers and whiners and, and, and the, the, it's like theatrics, right? Because this person's life really matters. So all of a sudden you see this kind of cultural thing going on. So it's like drama, right? It's like, geez. So when you understand that, it's like, wow, this is like, this is interesting. Point Peter's like, man, uh, I signed up for this, huh, Lord? Okay, praise the Lord. <clears throat> so obviously it shows here that they all showed, those who were close to her, showed that she was an amazing and gifted seamstress. And she had made her some, them some nice designer garments. Very nice. Praise the Lord. Next. But Peter put them all outside. He's like, yo, I don't need the drama to jack up with the move of God in the upper room. I don't need a lack of faith to stop what God wants to do. Sometimes you need to get people out of your life that are trying to stop the move of God. Some of y'all need to kick some people out of the room, at least for a season, or at least maybe just for a moment. These weren't kicked out forever. For a moment and say, yo, I just got it some prayer. I got it some miracles that got to happen. And you're just not, you're not helping out. Amen. So Peter puts them all outside and he knelt down and he prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. She opened her eyes and when she saw Peter, she sat up. Stop, do not move that, please. How amazing is it? He goes in, he gets them all out of the way, right? Get out of here. And he goes in there and he just kneels. And he's like, God, please make it happen. No, he doesn't. He might feel that, but he's like, God, I know you're going to make it happen. Tabitha, arise. She doesn't say, Tabitha, that the count of 10, could you possibly consider moving around a little bit? No. He's like, yo, Tabitha, arise. And I want you guys to speak to things in your life and talk to those things and tell them to arise. But you all, they will only arise if you find yourself in God's upper room. That's what I'm saying. Let's go. So she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. Whoop. Let's keep going. And she gave her his hand, and he raised her up. And then calling the saints and the widows, he presented her alive. Amen. And it became known throughout all of Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Amen. Let's stand up as we close and pray. It is communion, so we'll be doing communion after this prayer. So hang tight, in Jesus' name. We had so many things going on this month that we haven't been able to do communion, but we will do it today, in Jesus' name. We will not be denied, in Jesus' name. So let's just raise our hands. Lord, I thank you that the upper room isn't just a place, but a spiritual space. It is a posture of the heart. It is not just people seeking the presence of God, but people committed to the will of God. Amen. Today, Lord, I ask right now that you would strengthen each one of your sons and daughters in this place. Lord, I introduce them if they have not been introduced to your upper room, to the, a new realm, to a new life, to new possibilities, to new breakthroughs, to new power. If you're here today and you don't fully know the peace of being in the upper room, I want you to come forward today. You know who you are. Nobody's finger pointing, only God. If you need some part of your life to be renewed, to be revived, to be restored, to be given life again. If you say, God, I want this part of my life to come alive, I want you to come forward. I want you to know that God does beautiful things to those who are submitted and surrendered to his will. 
Lord, I just speak life over Kingdom Rise Church, over every family. And Lord, I thank you for our children that have just come into this room, for those that made it here today and those who weren't able to be here, and for those families that weren't able to be here. And I ask, Lord, that they would find their upper rooms, wherever they're at today, and that this message would resonate in the spirit, and that waves of grace would break through and touch their hearts and change their destinies in Jesus' name.